I am Betty Collins, and this is Inspiring Women, a podcast presented by my company, Bradyware. This is the podcast that advances women toward economic, social, and political achievement. And I, Betty Collins, am here to inspire you today on your journey in life, which includes so many things. This is all about you. I am thankful that you're listening, but more importantly, that you're investing time in yourself. You can find more about inspiring women in this episode on the resources tab at bradyware.com. So today we're going to interview interview, um, somebody from Golden Reserve. And what we really, really like about this person, first, she's a millennial, she's full of life, she's energetic, and she's just been starting her career. And we just really wanted to talk today about her generation. Um, I am not a millennial. I don't even know what really bracket I'm in. I just know I'm 58, right? Um, And so we want to talk about millennials. Everyone wants to kind of put them in a box sometimes, you know, so we want to get inside your brain a little bit, but since that's what you are. But so first, before we get started, talk about a little bit, two, three minutes of just kind of about you, you know, in Golden Reserve and and just take some time to, to introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah. Hi, I'm Danielle Godby. I'm a retirement planner with Golden Reserve and a millennial. Yes. So I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk about things in a light that, that might not be millennials are killing the cinema industry. Yeah. <laughs> what industry are we killing next? You know, um, I don't think that's the impression that my fellow millennials have of ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of uh, intergenerational, I won't call it bullying. It's all in good fun, you know, yeah. but I feel, you know, boomers are very down on millennials and Gen, Gen Z is also, you know, so I feel that it's good to have a representation of us that is true. Um, so I grew up in Mount Vernon, Ohio. Oh, okay. Yep. I went to Ohio University down in Athens, and I studied exercise physiology. Okay. So that's a, something near and dear to me so that I can learn how to improve my own health and, and to help people around me mm-hmm. to improve their health. That's always been top of mind for me. Yeah. I love to help people. I um, I did ballet for 14 years. Oh, very nice. <laughs> wow. How talented. That's, I mean, that's, that takes strength. That takes a lot of discipline. Discipline is the word I would use. Yeah. Certainly. Um, yeah. But I remember finding that, you know, that core of who you are that mm-hmm. always follows you. And you, you tell stories about where you start out and where you ended up. And I've always been teaching people. Yeah. I started in ballet. I was doing, we were doing stretches and people nearby would be, bent in a certain way and then like you know if you point your toe this way or straighten your leg in this way or or pivot this way it's going to feel a lot better and I've always been helping people in little yeah. ways like that so you know I found um, a strange little journey I don't know very many people who graduated with their bachelor's and then continued on in, in that field and yeah. I had done that for a while I did fitness for about 10 years mm. managed uh, boutique fitness studios like Row House and um what was the AKT, the Amanda Kaiser technique. Um, I love kickboxing, so a handful of, of different things that I've done in the past, but I don't think that it's it's something that I have to do to limit myself to being good at one thing. Yeah. You know? So yep. I learn that now. Do three things well, not <laughs> ten things average. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. So Well, yeah, my daughter loves kickboxing. I mean, and so for Christmas, um, I always have my kids give a gift their spouse gives them a gift that they don't know is coming because everything else is done with links and they give me these lists and they know everything that's going to be open. So I said, are you sure you want to buy her boxing gloves? <laughs> he goes, I can handle it. I got it. Incredible. But yeah, but she loves <laughs> out how it, it's a good venting for her. It's Absolutely. a great, you know, plus she really works out and, and, and it's a good exercise. A phenomenal so. workout. Well, let's talk the the one thing millennials and 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 I don't look as millennials as the enemy, by the way. But you know, a lot of <laughs> times they're known for job hopping. Sure. I mean, I mean that is it's kind of the environment, and and in fact, it's three times higher than than that of non millennials who do the same job. So, you know, I'm a business owner. You really probably are too in what you do. Um, I need to make it easier for millennial prospects to to choose me. You know, because I'm a little sure. bit older. Um, and choose me over my competition. But what exactly in your mind do many millennials look for in their job search? You know, what's that priority to them? What's what are the, the, what's going to attract them, right? 
Well, we have to keep in mind the advice that we've been receiving since we were children. Like people in your generation have been telling people in my generation to look for something that they love, Mm -hmm. right? Do something that you love. You'll never work a day in your life. And then we all laughed collectively because it's still work, right? Right. (laughs) Um, But I think I hear a lot of buzzwords like impact or, you know, what does that really mean? And I think when I talk to my friends, it's a lot about feeling fulfilled by the work that they do, Mm -hmm. being able to go home at night and know that they helped someone do something better, or they can feel better about their contributions to their own community. And so it's not, it's not necessarily about how much money you can make, which honestly is quite surprising given all the student loan debt that is, you know, saddling my generation, but that's really not the dialogue that I hear. It's a lot more about feeling good about what they do and feeling appreciated in what they do. Yeah. So when, when, when millennials look in job searching, I know my daughter is, is looking to do some job search or to, to make a change. She is more concerned first about truly their mission statement and the culture, and she wants to know what they're doing in the community. Now that's coming from my daughter. We didn't talk about money a whole lot. We didn't talk about, you know, her career aspirations in five years. What do you want to do? She talked about those things first. Talk talk to me about your generation with those things being, you know, mission, culture, and what do they really do for the community? Is that a driver for you? Is that going to be an attractor to you for a place to work? I think workplace culture is definitely a priority for me. Yeah. You know, I've left... I left places because I don't feel happy or comfortable. I've, I've turned down jobs that were six figures because I didn't like the story they were painting of their workplace culture. Yeah. And it boiled down to, I think the question they asked me was, do you ever lose sleep at night over your work? And I said, no, I do not, because I leave it all on the table every day, and I know that. And I get yeah. to go home, and I get to close my laptop and feel good about what I did that day. And I thought to myself, that's not very... Uh, it doesn't prioritize my mental health yeah. or my time off. And then what is the point of then having all that money if you have no time to use it yeah. or family or friends to spend it on, you know? Yeah. And so what are they doing in the community? I did not interview Golden Reserve and ask them what sort of, um, I don't know, philanthropy they were involved in, but right. it is important to me to know that their mission is to offer people tools to fight back against the financial industry. Mm-hmm. And Okay. What I mean by that is, like, seniors don't have as many resources as the rest of us. Like, we are very well prepared to plan for retirement, but once we get into retirement, the skills are very different. The view is different, and, and it makes me very happy to know that we are doing extra things for that group. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Well, of course, this is a... Um that we'll, we'll put you in the box because all of you want ping pong tables and free beer, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what, what about the ping pong tables and the free beer that you hear that other companies are doing? You know, you see that. Is this something that really millennials want? I mean, is that, you know, a preference when they're picking a company that will that help them learn, grow and be better or be, you know, who they want to be to have those, that typical, ping pong table work and I can be in flip flops and we have beer at lunch and nobody cares. I mean, is that really a driver for you? Well, I can only speak for myself. I would, I would say no, definitely not. Those things are, are very novel. I love that we have a fancy schmancy water machine in our office and I can have cucumber water when I want. Okay. Uh, but I can make cucumber water at home. Right. You know, I think for me, it's just wanting the resources required to do my job really well. And I want a group of people around me who will assume the best in me and offer me accommodations if I need them or, you know, yes, wearing flip flops. That's great. I'm wearing flip flops right now. I love that. It makes me feel happy. Right. You know, it, if that's a deal breaker for my job, I wonder how serious I am about that job. You know? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, I like the way you say that. That's good. Yeah. Now, when you first interviewed for your job, it, was it a, you just knew that this is it? And I'm, I'm going, and I'm going to jump in and do this. Well, they had a very different approach on their job posting. So okay. a lot of the job postings in any sales position have to do with commission only, or what do we need from you? We need top closers, top performers, very disciplined people who know what they're doing. Like, 
that's the dialogue is always, this is what I need from you. And if you can't check these boxes, then move on, you know, take it or leave it. And that's always what I read. But this one was very backwards. It was, this is what we're prepared to offer to you. This is our six to 12 months of training with a partner of the firm. You know, we're seeking people that don't have finance backgrounds. And I Mm -hmm. asked them about that. I said, you know, I have a decade of fitness experience on this resume. Does that give you pause? Yeah. And they said, no, because you have, you know, you have personality and you have the desire to learn and we'll teach you everything else that you need to know. Yeah. And so ping pong tables and and free beer, that's not really my style. But if I have someone who's willing to look at me and my strengths and my shortcomings and say, hey, let me meet you where you are. Yeah. And let me give you some training where you need it to watch you shine, like that goes a long way. Right. So are millennials getting a bad rap when that's what we think that they like and that they're motivated by? (laughs) I mean, Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, is that not a fair, you know, assessment? Because... Sure. You know your generation. Is that really... I mean, you're speaking for you, but is that not a fair assessment to put everyone in that box? The best advice I've ever gotten is someone else's opinion of me is none of my business. And so if I look at Gen Z and think they're the Tide Pod people, yeah. that's not maybe a fair representation of their generation. Right. But it's none of their business what I have to think about them and vice versa. You know, all I can do is represent myself mm-hmm. and what I know to be good and true. And when people get to know me, they see those qualities over time. So, it, I mean, if I have to pleasantly surprise employer after employer that I don't want their <laughs> ping pong tables and they can return them and, and save a couple hundred dollars. Well, we've an audience with a lot of business owners and, you know, <laughs> and so I'm hoping they're hearing what you're saying. I mean, you're sure. getting to something that we all have just think is the thing, right? Mm. And it's, and it's the not, novel thing, right? The novel thing. That's a good way to say it. So, so, you know, income is not among millennials top five factors when they're applying for a job. I don't even know what my daughter, who I'm helping, wants in salary. We've never talked about it. Interesting. Yes. But it still has to matter with the high student debt that you have. Um, But among your friends, among your colleagues and your peers, do you find that they value other job attributes like learning and advancement more than they do income? You've already kind of touched on that, but let's expand on that. Definitely. Uh, There are a few different things that I hear come up in conversation and And they're surprising to me. You would think income would be front and center of Mm -hmm. the conversation, given that we were taught our whole lives to prepare for college. And then college seemed to be the only option. Mm -hmm. For me, that was the only presentation. My mom's, you're going to college. Right. No one in our family did. You are. And I'm like, well, I guess I am. Yeah. How will we pay for it? You know? So I would think that would be more, more prevalent. But what I hear is... They want to make an impact. They want to feel good about what they do. They want to have flexibility to work from home if they need it or to take mental health days to have work-life balance, I think is a really important thing. Or then you can go into the benefits package can really make a big difference. Right. Like if you have health care, that could make a huge difference. I know a lot of potential business owners who are one foot in their job and one foot out because they have health care at that job, right? And they have Mm -hmm. benefits Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't otherwise have. Or things like paternity leave. You know, I hear a lot of maternity leave, but how many dads get the chance to go home and spend time with their new babies? Right. You know, it's the the little things that kind of flag someone's humanity for me. And I, again, I'm one person, I can speak for myself, but when I talk to my friends, they like to leave their job and know they feel good being there. They don't want to have to vent about their coworkers or, or their managers or how how the culture there doesn't align with them. You know, that's a very stressful experience. It just right. gets in the way of doing the job. And so it sounds simple, but if you can just be good people to each other and remove the barriers between that person and accomplishing the goal of their job, that's that's it. Right. right. You know, that's it. I know my son has said to me, um, with his children, and they're three and one and a half, but he's like, I'm not going to just say college is your only option. There are all kinds of things that you can do, but it all starts with passion for, for him. And both of my kids, everything was about, this is the experience I want to do. She ended up being a teacher. He's a hospice chaplain, and I'm a business person. Yeah, very <laughs> they give me a ba- yeah, They give me a bad rap. It, but that, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So um, 
business owners want to, I think they want to do a better job though retaining millennials. They want that future. They want that next generation. They do. I mean, we, we talk about it in Brady. We're now a lot, Mm -hmm. not just who's going to replace Betty Collins, but who's going to replace Betty Collins replace place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just me. And here's somebody now we're trying to think in two generations. Sure. So they want to keep them, but, but investing in, in their learning advancement can be costly and it can be uncomfortable sure. for us to take that risk to some degree because we're going okay of course we're thinking you want you know the novelties more than substance maybe sure too but what can business owners do to motivate them to stay and then they're you know you're not looking for the next thing or the next best thing and, sure. and that kind of thing how can we do that well i think it, it's very basic and if you pull it back to the bare bones. It's just building a relationship with someone that's that's strong, right? Yeah. Consistent. You want something that lasts. So you have to invest in that relationship. Right. It doesn't matter if it's a friendship, a romantic relationship, or a work relationship. You know, you have to continue to follow up with these people and, and check in with them and offer them choices. Um, but I've noticed some of the things that piqued my interest is I'll hear someone who's been in a job for a long time and they seem to get these, I'm using air quotes here, promotions, right? And they're getting mm-hmm. two other people's jobs, but there's no pay increase for these people. And so they're being, it feels like a reward. They're being rewarded with this opportunity, but then it also feels like a punishment. Yeah. Why do I have to do all this extra work just because I'm good at it? You know, and so to me, it's, it might be simple on one side, not being a business owner yet. You know, I have right. a business mindset, but I don't have to work with a P&L. Right. So, but consistent opportunities for promotions, you know, lateral roles in the same job. You don't have to leave your workplace, but maybe they're sick of doing that role. Maybe they want something where they can be paid the same and do Mm -hmm. something else and contribute in a different way. Or, you know, ultimately, if it's a good workplace culture, I've been hit with a couple (coughs) non-compete agreements in my time. And I mean, that's very common in fitness. It's common in finance, common in you know, anywhere. the cosmetology I mean, industry. Right. Yeah, so anywhere that there's sales, you have talented people, you want to retain them, and there's a little bit of fear. Like, I just invested so much time, so many resources into you and your growth. I don't want you to leave me. And that's reasonable and fair. But if you take that into, let's say, a romantic relation, relationship, and you've invested all this time and dates into this one person, you say, I don't want right. to fully commit to you because what if you leave me? Yeah. And that's not a very productive or fruitful way to live a great in a relationship, reason. yeah, right? But, I mean, it's not easy to be the first one to go first. But one of the things I really liked about Golden Reserve is that they said, hey, we're going to take a bet on you, and you're going to take a bet on us. And it's going to take a lot of work on your part, but we're here for you, and here are your resources. Mm. And it's up to you if you succeed. And they told me there, that one in ten people make it in this industry, that I've decided to go into six months ago. Right, right. <laughs> but you're making it. You know, I have the audacity and the boldness to know that's me. I have to be that one person out of 10. Yeah. But I don't think I would be that comfortable if they weren't ready to sponsor my licensure or my certificates or mm-hmm. to give me training when I ask for it, you know, right. so. But you felt like they were all in with you. It wasn't here's what we'll do, but Mm -hmm. here's what we'll do if it was we're all in. Yes. And people don't want to leave jobs like that because they become family. Yeah. And it's not like that. We're all a family here, so we're going to abuse you mentally, sort of. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Get you. I've seen some some memes. As a millennial, we communicate in memes, right? But um, the places that are the hardest for me to leave are places that feel like family, the communities that I've built. Mm -hmm. and different fitness studios. I was really, really sad to leave those, but I was guided by people who know and love me that job hopping is how you make more money. Mm -hmm. And if you leave one job, you get to bump your pay a lot. And if you do that every few years, you get more experience and more skills and more pay. What's stopping us from keeping that person there and still giving them these bumps and these opportunities to contribute? Yeah, I guess would be my question. Well, let me ask you a few things and see what you, I mean, because first of all, do you feel like you, your generation, the, 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 you guys who are going to take over the world one day and, and we're all going to be going, they took over the world, right? When you hear things like 
do you want a mentor? I want to be your mentor. Um, or I'm a mentee. I can't be a mentor or whatever. What do you think of mentor mentee relationships, your generation that, you know, are you open to being teachable? Are you open to hearing and, and being part of somebody who just might know more, you know, or they might really want to generally help you? Absolutely. Just expand on that a little bit. I think everybody knows something that I don't know. And you never know unless you listen to them talk Mm -hmm. and you ask them to tell you their story. And I am very supportive of any mentorship that I I hear about or participate in. I don't think being a mentee precludes you from mentoring someone else because we have diverse skills and we can offer a lot to different groups of people. And I think if you are very closed off to that, you're going to have a very hard time yeah. in, um, in anything that you do. And that's one of, the, one of the things that I attribute to my success in being flexible enough to go from one industry to the next mm-hmm. is being coachable. Because yeah. if I came from a decade of fitness experience and I was closed off to the idea of somebody knowing more than me, I would know a fraction of what I know now. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't have nearly as much success as I do now in this new role. And I would probably be really lonely and anxious about it, too. Right. You know, why is it just my job to do this when there's a wealth of information around me? I think I'm a little bit... I like to offer value before I ask for anything. So engaging in those relationships can can be, I don't know, complex, difficult, I guess, to approach someone and say, hey, can you mentor me? Right. Like, what am I supposed to offer that person, you know? So... I think it's more comfortable in situations where I've met people who I know I can help and I say, hey, you know, I drop little breadcrumbs for them. I let them come to me. I don't want to be overbearing at all. Sure. Either side of that is a difficult conversation, though. Like, I know something that would benefit you. I want to I mm-hmm. take you under my wing. That's delicate. But then being the person who wants to know more is delicate, too. So. Right. Because I think there is a huge desire of the boomers, which is kind of where I'm in. I was born in 63, so I don't know where I'm at, but it doesn't matter to me. I really could care less. <laughs> but we love to be able to mentor, but it sometimes turns into we're going to tell you all we know and what we think. And it, and then it isn't a relationship where you're going to really go. You're not going to hear us. You sure. Sure. So sure, but I think your generation two or generations that you know two and three behind me are craving somebody that was willing to jump in with them, whether it's hard or not, you know, whether it's a it's awkward or not, right? Definitely. So, so interesting thing about you is you when we talked uh, just a, before we started in the podcast, all I find intriguing is that you were a ballerina. Okay. I don't know very many ballerinas. And you did that for what about, you said 14 years. Mm -hmm. And you said, I I learned a lot of things about when I was a ballerina. Definitely. Talk about that. Well, I've always been a dancer. I think um, that was my mother's (laughs) not so subtle way of getting me out in front of people. Okay. Um, Just, she says my father's very awkward around people and he's very, uh, he's so, he's very shy Yeah. and she didn't want that for me. And so (laughs) for better or for worse, I was three years old and she stuck me in a tutu. Get on stage, right? (laughs) (laughs) So I've been performing since I was very, very little and I I didn't really know anything else and which is good because I'm pretty extroverted Mm -hmm. and it would be a strange combination of quality to be extroverted and also shy. Right. Right. So I think you learn a lot about your limitations and how strong you can be. I think dance is a powerful form of self-expression. You know, I, I didn't have an outlet for that after college, and that's what prompted me to start group fitness. Yeah. And I missed it so much because it helped me feel valued. Mm-hmm. Like I was contributing to my community. I had impact. Yeah. Right. All these things. And so kind of to bring this back into our earlier conversation it's kind of like you can look for these things in a job but it's almost the same concept of putting all of your eggs in one basket and looking for the same thing Mm -hmm. in a romantic partner for example like you you want them to be your everything your whole universe and that's just not realistic right one job cannot be your whole universe it's not realistic so I think it's important to sort of pad your life with things that bring you joy and that bring you passion and so I find all sorts of opportunities to dance, whether that's in my kitchen or at a ballroom dancing studio mm-hmm. that I just found, um, you know, fitness dance classes. I think it brings people out of their comfort zone 
yeah. in a really beautiful way. Well, I will say to you that um, it would be good if we just took our labels off. You know, I kind of want to end with a little bit about that, whether I'm a boomer or an X or a gen. Um, if we took our, if we took those names away, it would be so much better, right? I agree. And, and then just, you know, having these kind of conversations, you've been such a delight today. It's just, it <laughs> restores you. my faith in, oh, okay, there are generations behind me that get a lot at, a, at your age. You're just, you know, because I, I shouldn't ask this, but how old are you? <laughs> I'm 29 in July. 29 in July. It's coming up. Okay, okay. We say we're 29 again many times. <laughs> I'm at the age I'll <laughs> always be. Yo, yeah, yeah that's be, right. That's I'm right. Here. I have arrived. So what would you like to say to my audience, who probably looks a lot like me, okay, um, as a kind of a closing inspirational thing coming from a millennial that we're not going to call you a millennial, but what would you want to say to my audience that would just maybe wrap up all this in a, in a nice bow? Well, I think if you can approach another human being with kindness and curiosity, it goes a really long way, no matter who you're talking to or what kind of conversation you're having because there are many people in every generation that I've met who go in with this, this thought that they, they already know what that person's about to say, and that closes you off to actually listening to them. Mm -hmm. And so listening actively, being genuinely curious about what that other person has to say is, is going to solve a lot of problems before they begin. Yeah. You know, and There are a lot of really educated, passionate people out there who just want to meet someone else in the middle. Right. It takes two to tango. I don't think it's an easy one, one sentence answer by any no. stretch. But I mean, I'll stop making fun of boomers as soon as they stop making fun of me. Right. That's not going to work. I'm going to have to stop first. Yeah. Right. And then boomers can see that and they can say like, okay, right. Maybe I'll give this one slack. <laughs> I, I have a lot of people under the age of 40 here and they'll say to me when your generations keeps using the word you millennials, we shut down immediately. We don't have. We don't hear anything else you have to say. True. So if we learn something today, it's that let's <laughs> stop putting everyone in a box. Well, Danielle, it's a, it's been a pleasure to interview you today. I think my audience will get a lot out of what you have to say. Totally invigorating. Totally inspiring. And that's what we do at Inspiring Women. As your career advancements continue, your financial opportunities will grow. You need to be prepared. And you can do that by going to our website, bradyware.com, to find out more about us and the accounting services that we provide. All this and more about the podcast can be found in the episode show notes.